Okay, so here we see that F does not exist. G will equal 27, H will equal 1, and I will equal negative 2. So if you want to see these worked in more detail, go ahead and find them in the video. Otherwise, you can move on to the next section. Okay, let's look at F. First thing I try is direct substitution, and I check that in the denominator. And I'd have x plus 5 over um, 3 squared minus 9, and that's going to give me 0. So this isn't going to work. Next thing I want to check is can I factor? x plus 5 doesn't factor, but x squared minus 9 does. x squared minus 9 factors to x plus 3 and to x minus 3. So I factor to x plus 3 and x minus 3. That's not enough on its own. I need to be able to cancel. That's what gets my 0 out of the denominator. But neither, neither of these cancel with x plus 5. So I can't take this limit out. Now maybe if this were asking for a left-sided limit, I could estimate numerically and find that it would be positive or negative infinity. Uh, in fact, I have infinite, a limit, uh, infinite discontinuities both at x equals negative 3 from this factor and at x equals positive 3 for this factor. So I could... Uh, and I see that's, that's what's causing me the problem here. And I could find, is that positive infinity or 11, negative infinity from the left or from the right? But this is asking for my two-sided limit, not a left or a right limit. And if I have an infinite discontinuity, infinite discontinuity, if I have this asymptote, the asymptote, then my two-sided limit cannot exist, therefore this limit does not exist. Okay, so for g, first thing I'm going to try is direct substitution in the denominator. I'm going to substitute this in for x, 2 times 3 halves minus 3. Uh, 2 times 3 halves, the 2's would cancel. That would leave me 3 minus 3 is 0. So that's not good. I need to go back and see if I can factor. And this is going to be a factoring of cubes. Um, so I have 8x cubed minus 27. Uh, factoring that would be the cubed root of 8x cubed, or 2x uh, minus the cubed root, sorry, uh, minus the cubed root of 27, which is 3 times the first squared uh, plus the first times the second, or sorry, minus the first times the second, minus 2x times negative 3 is positive 6x, and then the last squared, negative 3 squared, is going to be um, positive 9. So that's my numerator. My denominator is still 2x minus 3, and that's convenient because now that denominator factor that was causing me 0 here cancels out, which means that I have a removable or point discontinuity at x equals 3 halves. Because I could take this 2x minus 3, and set it equal to 0, 2x equals 3, divide both sides by 2, and x equals 3 halves. That means if I plugged my 3 halves in here and divided that, uh, sorry, plugged my 3 halves in here and multiplied, I get 0 in the denominator. It makes it discontinuous. The function is undefined there. Now that I've canceled that out, I can still take my limit. This is still the limit as x approaches 3 halves. So the limit as x approaches 3 halves of this um, similar function, 4x squared plus 6x plus 9. I evaluate that for 3 halves. So uh, 4 is 
3 halves squared plus 6 times 3 halves plus 9. Uh, 3 halves squared is 9 fourths. 4 times 9 fourths plus uh, 6 and 2 cancel, leaving 3 on top. So 3 times 3 is 9, plus 9. And fourths cancel here. 9 plus 9 plus 9 equals 27. All right, so H. First thing I want to do is check, can I use direct substitution in the denominator? I evaluate my function at the A that my limit is approaching, that my X is approaching. But negative 2 plus 2 will give me 0. That means I need to do something. And I don't have anything to factor, but I do have a radical to rationalize. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom times the conjugate. Doing so multiplies this function times 1. It changes its form, not its value. And I want everything in the denominator that I multiplied it by to be the same, except this sign outside the radical. I'm going to change that to the opposite. That's what's going to make the conjugate. So I'm going to multiply this times radical 2x plus 5 and a 1, but this will become a positive. And the same thing on the top and the bottom means that I'm multiplying this uh, function by a very sort of squat 1 here, because anything divided by itself is 1. So I go ahead and multiply, and this is uh, binomial sum and difference of squares on the top. My sum and difference of squares says I square the first. Well, squaring a radical undoes the radical, and that gives me 2x plus 5. And then I subtract squaring the last. 1 times 1 is minus 1. And then recall, I don't want to change, uh, multiply out my denominator. I just want to write them, write them as factors. So this is x plus 2 times radical 2x plus 5 plus 1 because my whole goal is to cancel this out so that I can directly evaluate at negative 2, and I won't end up with a 0 in the denominator anymore. So let's simplify the numerator a little bit. Uh, 2x plus 5 minus 1 is plus 4. I still don't see that I can cancel exactly, but I could factor this numerator. I can factor out a common 2. So I have 2 times x plus 2. This is still the limit as x approaches negative 2. And my denominator, x plus 2 times radical 2x plus 5 plus 1. Now I have these x, minus, uh, x plus 2s that I can cancel. This means I have a point discontinuity at x equals negative 2 at x equals negative 2. That's a point removable discontinuity, and I'm left with the limit as x approaches negative 2 of 2 over radical 2x plus 5 plus 1. And the moment I canceled out that x minus 2, now I can directly substitute. I'm going to take each, well, I just have one x here and fill in negative 2 for that. Gives me 2 over radical. 2 times negative 2 plus 5, radical extends there, plus 1. That is 2 over negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, plus 1 is 5. Radical 1 plus 1, radical 1 is 1, plus 1 equals 2. This gives me 2 over 2, which equals 1. Okay, this brings us to i, and I can check for my direct substitution. If I were to plug 1 in down here, I'd get 1 minus 1 is 0, so that's not going to work. I have a radical, so I need to rationalize. 
going to multiply times the conjugate. That's everything identical except this outside sign changed. 1 plus radical 2x squared minus 1. Same thing in the denominator and the numerator. By doing this, I'm multiplying times something divided by itself. Anything divided by itself is 1. When I multiply by 1, I change the form but not the value. When I multiply by 1, I change the form but not the value. So let's go ahead and multiply this out. I have a sum and difference binomial in the numerator. That means the first squared, or the first times each other, 1, minus the last squared. Now, this is going to be a binomial. And when I multiply anything in a radical times itself, the radical goes away. But I need to keep parentheses on this binomial because it's minus the whole thing, not just minus the 2x squared. So eventually I'll need to distribute and simplify. In the denominator, I do not want to distribute or simplify. My whole goal is to be able to eventually cancel this out. To cancel it out, it has to stay factored. So I'm just going to write this as two factors that theoretically are being multiplied times each other. x squared minus 1. Let's go ahead and distribute and simplify this numerator a little bit. 1 minus 2x squared plus 1. What I'm doing here is distributing this negative times the positive 2x squared becomes a negative 2x squared. Distributing the negative times a negative 1, and it becomes a positive 1. And I could rewrite that 2 minus 2x squared. Still the limit as x approaches 1 and x minus 1, 1 plus radical 2x squared minus 1. Okay, I'm getting closer, but I still can't cancel that x minus 1. I do see in the numerator that I could factor 2 out. So let's go ahead and do that. And I get 1 minus x squared. This is looking really close to being able to factor. 2x squared minus 1, but what's kind of throwing me here is that this, this is 1 minus x squared, and I've got an x minus 1. It's not squared, so I think maybe I need to factor this 1 minus x squared. That's a, a difference of squares, which is going to factor to a sum and difference. That's going to give me 1 minus x and 1 plus x. still over this, and 1 plus radical 2x squared minus 1. I'm very close now. What I'll find is that when I have these two factors here, this 1 minus x and x minus 1, these look so similar, but what's wrong is they're in different orders. And there's two ways I could do this. I could do this the long way, and factor a negative 1 out of this factor right here. When I factor a negative 1 out, then it changes the signs of everything inside, and the x becomes positive, and the 1 becomes negative. Or I can just know the shortcut if I have two binomials that I want to cancel, and their signs are wrong. So here my x is positive, but here my x is negative. Here my 1 is negative, but here my 1 is positive. When all the signs are exactly 1, I can cancel them out and write a negative 1 to be left behind. So either way, I have just canceled out that troublesome x minus 1. This means now I can start taking my limit through direct substitution. As x approaches 1, I'm left with 2 times 1 plus x over 1 plus radical 2x squared minus 1. And evaluate this for 1. Go ahead and plug my 1 in for x and my 1 in for x here. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1. This gives me 4 over 2 or 2. 
And there's our answer. Okay, we have one more set of practice problems before we get into properties of limits. This is J, K, L, and M. Go ahead and try these, and then I will show the answers, and you can check your work and see which ones you need to follow along on. Okay, so here you can see that J would be does not exist, K would be positive infinity, L would be positive infinity, and M would be negative infinity. If you got all of these correct, go ahead and skip ahead to the next page. We're skipping the question at the very bottom. You can skip ahead to the next page. Otherwise, uh, go ahead and skip to the problem that you need to see worked. All right, looking at J, we can see that if I plug the zero in for X, I'm gonna get zero in the denominator. This is an immediate problem. So instead, I'm gonna look at this fraction and say, how can I simplify this and hopefully cancel that X out? And this is my major uh, difference between numerator and denominator. So I'm gonna rewrite, and really I can kind of write this the limit as X approaches zero of, this whole thing is my numerator, 1 over x plus 2 plus 1 over x divided by all of this divided by x. Or times 1 over x. So that's nice. That's a little bit less factory. But before I can multiply times 1 over x, before I can multiply times the reciprocal, I really need to combine these two into one uh, fraction. So I need a common denominator, and that common denominator is going to be x times x plus 2. That's the smallest thing that both x will divide into and x plus 2 will divide into. So to do that with this fraction, I need to multiply top and bottom by x. And to do that with the second fraction, I need to multiply top and bottom times x plus 2. Okay. So this gives me the limit as x approaches 0 of x plus x plus 2 all over x times x plus 2. And it's this whole fraction times 1 over x. I can simplify this a bit. Uh, x plus x is 2x. So I have the limit as x approaches 0 of 2x plus 2. And I'll go ahead and um, multiply this out. This will be x squared plus 2x. No, I think I won't. I want to be able to factor if I need to, uh, cancel if I need to. So I'm going to change my mind. Move that like that, times 1 over x. Now remember, it's this x right here, this x that's causing me the problem. It's that x I want to be able to cancel. So I'm going to go ahead and simplify this fraction all the way now. I have uh, 2x plus 2. I could factor that to 2 times x plus 1 over this x times this x is x squared times x plus 2, but I still didn't cancel an x out of the denominator. In fact, I have two x's in the denominator now. And if I put a 0 in there, I still get a 0 in the denominator. Therefore, this has an infinite discontinuity, infinite discontinuity, because I have a non-cancelable um, factor in the denominator that will make this equal zero. So graphically, this is going to have an asymptote. This will have an asymptote at uh, x equals zero. It will be a vertical, vertical asymptote. So here's j. It does not exist because we have an infinite discontinuity at x equals zero causing a vertical asymptote. So for k, if I try plugging 2 in, 2 squared is 4 minus 4 is 0. This is giving me problems in the denominator right away. So let's go ahead and try factoring. And when I factor this function, 
the limit as x approaches 2 of 3 plus 1, sorry, 3x plus 1 times x plus 2 over x plus 2 times x minus 2. And I check and I have these x plus 2s that will cancel. So that's great. I have a removable or point discontinuity at x equals negative 2. Um, so I've canceled something out. I could try plugging my 2 in again. But when I plug it in here, I get 2 minus 2 is 0. I still have this 0 left in the denominator. So um, this is uh, 3x plus 1 over x minus 2, but I can't just plug it in. And there's nothing more I can cancel. And if this were just asking for the limit as x approaches 2, my answer would be that limit does not exist because at 2 there is an infinite discontinuity. There is a vertical asymptote. However, this problem is not asking for the two-sided limit. It is asking for the limit from the right. So I just need to ev uh, evaluate this simplified function that's left over. Limit as x approaches 2 from the right of 3x plus 1 over x minus 2. Now I'm going to do that by evaluating this for um, x equals something close to 2 but just barely greater than it. 2.1 is a good fit. So when I evaluate this for 2.1, that's 3 times 2.1 plus 1 over 2.1 minus 2. And again, I can do shorthand. This numerator, this is clearly going to be positive. It's a positive plus positive. And the denominator, 2.1 minus 2, is going to have a little bit left over of positive. Positive number over positive number is going to give me positive infinity. And I can know that it's positive infinity because I identified that at x equals 2, this one here, at x equals 2, I have an infinite discontinuity. All right, so we're going to find L is very similar to K, except we don't have to factor and cancel first. I can immediately try plugging my 3 in and find that I'm going to get 0 in the denominator. And there's nothing here that can cancel. If I were looking for a two-sided limit, I would say it does not exist because the fact that I have this factor in the denominator that will not cancel out means I have an infinite discontinuity at what makes this equal 0, which is at x equals 3. So my two-sided limit cannot exist at an infinite discontinuity. Um, my limits are going, my one-sided limit from the left and my one-sided limit from the right will be either positive or negative infinity. But this doesn't ask for the two-sided limit. It asks for the limit from the right. So I want my right-hand limit that's either going to be positive or negative infinity, and I need to find out which one is it. So I do that by evaluating this function for a value just greater than 3. And I'll find that f of 3.1, for instance, gives me 3.1 uh, times 2 plus 5 over 3.1 minus 3. That's going to be a positive, clearly, and this is still going to be just barely positive, which will give me positive infinity, which is what we saw was the answer there. Okay. So M asks us for the same function, but asks us to find the limit from the left. So same situation, I can identify that um, at 3, which it asks me to evaluate at, to find the limit approaching at 3, my denominator equals 0. And the factor that causes that 0 will not cancel out. That means that I have an infinite discontinuity, an infinite discontinuity, at x equals 3, so my left and right limits will be either infinity or negative infinity, but my two-sided limit does not exist, because even if I had two limits, that uh, a left and a right that both gave, uh, both approached positive infinity, for instance, 
even if my left and right limit both approach positive infinity, they would equal each other, but infinity is not a real number. So my two-sided limit would not exist. However, this problem asks me for the left limit. That means I just need to find uh, out, will this be positive infinity or will this be negative infinity? And to determine which, I'm going to explore the behavior of the graph very close to 3, but on the left side of it. So I want to find what is the value of my function at some number just barely less than 3, just barely less than 3, which will be, I'm going to choose 2.9. So f of 2.9 is going to be 2 times 2.9 plus 5 over 2.9 minus 3. My numerator is going to be positive, but my denominator, 3 is greater than 2.9. I'm going to get a negative down here. A positive divided by a negative is negative. Therefore, I can tell that my limit is going to be negative infinity. All right, so these properties of limits are actually kind of a breath of fresh air from a lot of the nitty-gritty of our algebraic limits. We're going to have several properties of limits here. We'll find, for instance, that the limit, um, if I'm taking the limit as x approaches the same value, of the sum of two functions, that is equal to the sum of the limit of each function. Note that it's still the limit. It's not the limit of f plus g. It's the limit of f plus the limit of g. And looking back up at the top, if uh, the limit of f equals l and the limit of g equals m, then this is going to equal l plus m, because that's what those limits equal. For number 2, uh, subtraction works the same way. It's going to equal the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Or in other words, the limit of a difference of functions is the difference of those two limits. Therefore, l minus m. Similarly, a quotient rule. The limit of a quotient of functions is equal to the quotient of the limit of the functions. Okay, and if f is l and g is m, then it's going to be l over m. Number four, uh, same thing with product. The limit of the product of functions is going to be the product of the limit of the functions times the limit as x approaches a of g of x. So these are all pretty straightforward here, therefore l times m. Number five is the limit of a, uh, a constant times a function. Basically, we call that, we can kind of say we pull, we can pull that constant out. So I can multiply times the constant on the outside, the constant times the limit of the function. Or C times that limit. Number six is our power rule which just works very basically. If I want to take the limit of a function raised to a power, I can raise that limit to the power. It should be p. I can raise this limit to that power p. Or in other words, it's going to be the limit of the function to the p power. And finally, my favorite, number seven, the limit of c, a constant as x approaches a. So what happens to c as x approaches a? And I've had students say the answer is x or the answer is a. 
And what I like to say is, if you had a banana pictured in your hands right now, you have a banana. That is a C banana. Take a Sharpie and write a C on your banana. So you have a banana. And then I cast a magic spell that turns all strawberries into cherries. What do you have? Well, you still have a banana because I turned, changed strawberries into cherries. The only things I affected were, were strawberries. They're now cherries. That does not affect your banana. So in this case, so in this case, what happens to this constant, this unchanging value, C, as X becomes A? Nothing, because C isn't X. So the limit of a constant as X approaches some other value is still just itself, be yourself. The answer is C, that constant. All right, we're on the final page. And maybe you're saying, that ah, maybe seemed a little bit too easy, that limit law stuff. It's not very difficult at all, but uh, we will be applying it in fuller context. And so we want to see what kind of a context we might apply that in. And these problems here give us an example, and I've pulled the graphs off to the side so that I can read them with you. Number, uh, I don't think these are even numbered. I'm going to number them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So one through nine, I'm going to do one through three with you. Uh, you know, I'll do one, four, and seven. One, four, and seven with you, and then I'll give you a chance to try the others on your own, and then we can go over them together. So this is good practice reading our limits graphically and then applying our limit laws. Number one asks us to find the limit as x approaches two from the left of f and of g. So first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this. Uh, Using my limit law, this is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of x. Now it's a little bit easier to see, okay, I can evaluate my limit of f as x approaches negative 2, so negative 2 from the left, and that gives me a value of negative 5. And then I can find my limit of g, graph g, as x approaches 2. Okay. So first I want to apply my limit laws. It says that the limit of the sum of my function is the sum of the limit of my functions. Limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of x. First I can look for my limit as x approaches 2 from the left on f, and here is 2 from the left, it's a y value of 3. Don't care about the value of the function, just what I'm approaching. And then for g, g of x graph is down here, approaching 2 from the left, here is 2, approaching from the left, I approach a y value of 1. Adding those together gives me 4. Okay, uh, number 4. This is asking for the quotient times a constant, so we're combining a couple of rules here together. The limit as x approaches 6. So I'm going to look over here and find uh, first my f as I approach 6. And it doesn't say from the left or the right, so it needs to converge from both directions. From the left, I approach negative 4, and from the right, I approach negative 4. So f of x is negative 4, but I keep my constant, negative 2 times negative 4. Now I need to find g of x. So I look at my g graph here, still the limit as x approaches 6. Uh, here's my function, and I approach from the left, and I approach a value of 6. 
And when I approach from the right, I approach a value of 6. So my g function is 6. This gives me 8 over 6, or 4 over 3. Okay, then let's look at number 7. This is asking just about g. I'm going to erase our work here and look more carefully at g. This one asks just about g and says the square root of 2 times uh, g of x, and I want the limit of this. So rewriting this with a limit law, I could say this is the square root of 2 times the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of x. The important thing here is that it has to be the limit of g of x, not the value of g of x. So I want this as I approach 2. Here is 2 from the left. So approaching from the left gives me a value of 1. I can plug that in. Radical 2 times 1. equals radical 2. Okay, go ahead and try these other problems and then come back, check the answers, and we'll work through them really briefly if you need to follow along. Okay, here you can view the answers and then jump to a given problem number if you'd like to see that problem worked. Otherwise, if you got all of these correct on your own, you are done. All right, we can't zoom in on these too far or we won't be able to see the graphs we need to analyze to get the limits. But looking at number two here, this is uh, the limit as x approaches negative one. A little bit difficult to see on my screen. So I'll go ahead and rewrite this with the limit laws. This is the limit as x approaches negative one of two times f of x minus the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 3 times g of x. All I've applied there is my subtraction uh, law, but I also have some constants. I could apply that also and say that it's going to be 2 times the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x minus 3 times the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x. Now I just need to know what are f of x, what are g of x, and I plug them in for these values. So this is the limit as x approaches negative 1. Here is negative 1 on uh, f of x, and it approaches from the left negative 6, so 2 times negative 6. And g approaches negative 1. Here it's negative 1. And from the left, it approaches negative 1. And from the right, it approaches negative 1. So minus 3 times negative 1. That gives me negative 12 plus 3 equals negative 9. Okay. Number 3 is a simple subtraction or difference law. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of f of x minus the limit as x approaches negative 3 of g of x. So now I'm just going to evaluate the limit as these approach negative 3. So f of x, here's negative 3, approaching from the left, I approach negative 2. Approaching from the right, I approach negative 2. Even though it's undefined there, that's okay. So this one's negative 2. For g, approaching negative 3. Here's negative 3. Approaching from the left is infinity. Approaching from the right is negative infinity, which means my two-sided limit does not exist. I can't add an existing limit to a limit that doesn't exist. So if any part of my limit does not exist, then my limit does not exist. And that's why does not exist because I have a vertical asymptote 
um, on g of x at x equals negative 3. Okay, number 5, we'll rewrite this according to our limit laws. Um, I have this constant. I'm going to go ahead and pull that out in the beginning, pull the 2 up. And then it's a product rule, so I can rewrite this 2 times the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x times the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x. Or in other words, 2 times this number times that number. Now I just need to find what those numbers are. So clear off our graphs a little here. The limit as x approaches 4 on f. Here's 4 from the left and from the right both converge on negative 3. And g, here's 4 from the left and from the right both converge on 4. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Negative 6 times 4 is negative 24. Number six, the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x squared. Or in other words, the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x, and it's this whole limit squared. So let's find the limit as x approaches negative 2 on f. Here's negative 2. I approach from the left and get negative 5. I approach from the right and get negative 5. So this is negative 5. And when I square it, I get 25. Number 8. This is a simple quotient, and this is as x approaches 2 from the right. So it's going to be the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x over the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of g of x. The limit as x approaches 2 on f, here's 2, it's from the right, so I'm approaching this way, I approach negative 2. And for g of x, approaching 2 from the right is 6, and that reduces to negative 1 third. Number 9 is a simple difference. This is as x approaches negative 1. As I approach negative 1 for f, here's negative 1. I approach this, and I approach a value of 6. And for g, as I approach negative 1 here, from the left, from the right is negative 1, minus negative 1. This one was negative 6. 6 minus negative 1 is negative 6, plus 1 is negative 5. And that's it.